My name is Brad. I'm the Connections Pastor here, so I want to say welcome to you guys as well. Thanks for joining us here this morning. Um, if you're watching online, good morning to you as well. Hey, real quick before we jump into um, the book of Ephesians, just something I wanted to make sure we kind of re-announce or re-say is so, and it's specifically for the women in here or watching or whatever, we've got a women's retreat coming up um, in very early March, and typically... Um, we kind of go somewhere close, I guess, but they're going to be going somewhere a little bit further away. They're actually going to leave town, which will be phenomenal. Um, but different than years past, like you can't sign up like two days before. Um, and so to make sure if you want to go, if you've been thinking about it, you want to go spend a, a Friday night and Saturday um, with other ladies from the church, um, the deadline to sign up, that's going to be the end of January. And so even though it's not till the beginning of March, Basically, February 15th, you can't sign up. And so I want to make sure you guys know that. We'll be talking about that, reminding you guys of that. Um, but anyway, just want to make sure we, 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 we say it out loud. It's a great time, I know, for the ladies to get together, dig into God's Word together, get to know each other some, um, and be, encourage you to check that out. But just so you know, if you're kind of that, oh, yeah, I'll just, it's, I'll sign up later, you know, you can't. <laughs> so just to make sure we say that. All right. Um, so um, in the summer of 1999, I just graduated high school, and I was transitioning to go down to college at UCA. And about six weeks after I graduated high school, I woke up and found myself in a little bit of a daze in the middle of the hospital. Um, I had tubes plugged into my arms. I had, there was beeping around me. There was this, it was a larger room than, you know, it wasn't just like an ER little ward. It was a larger room. Um, there was a couple of doctors in there, my family was there, and I was just trying to figure out, or I was trying to remember where I was, what was going on with me in my life, and why am I here, why am I feeling this way, um, I felt sick, I felt tight, my whole body was just like very constricted, um, and I it just, just felt like I was being squeezed to death, almost like a boa constrictor, it was pretty bad, and I didn't know what was going on. Um, what had happened was over the course of about two weeks, um, I developed like a rash down on my legs and we'd seen a doctor about it. They thought maybe I got like bit by a tick or something. They didn't know. And they're like, well, we'll just take some medicine. This should take care of it. Well, then just things progressively got worse until one day I was at my house and I literally woke up and I felt like I had like a couple hundred pound sacks of rice just laying on me. And I just, <gasps> I couldn't breathe and couldn't, couldn't just deal with anything. I couldn't have any strength. And so my parents sent me to the hospital and these doctors were just trying to figure out what was going on. Um, and over the course of time of about 10 days to two weeks, I spent time in the hospital. They're running tests, running tests, figuring this out, bringing in specialists, all these kinds of things. And it turns out I basically had like a, re a, a reaction to a virus of some kind. It, was, it had an autoimmune reaction to it. Where my body just decided to be like, you know what, let's just attack itself and just go to town. Um, and it was this rare, kind of weird, quirky little thing that can happen, and it had been documented in children, but usually it's already rare, but when it happens, it usually would happen between the ages of zero and two. Well, I was 18, and there had been like a hand, like literally a handful of cases ever that had happened that old, and now I was the next one on the list. And so, um, but in the course of trying to figure out what it was, I mean, they're just pumping me full of like, Every day it was like, well, let's give them some more steroids. Let's give them some more because nothing was happening. There was just more medicine to keep until there was a reverse reaction in my body to actually get better. And so finally they were able to, to figure out the right dose amount, figure out exactly what was going on and how they needed to treat it. Um, so then I became, you know, I had to still recover in the hospital. And then I became a little bit of a, of a, of a, I guess a case study. So like the doctor, this great internal specialist, he's like bringing in med school students, like, okay, look, here's what this looks like. Because like they're never going to see it again, right? You know, it's, it's only happened a handful of times. Um, and, and, it was, and I was so thankful that they figured out what it was. My family was obviously thankful. Um, but what's interesting is that, you know, when I graduated high school, um, I mean, I wasn't like the king of the world, but I was, you know, I would say top of my game, right? I, I played football. I was strong. I was like in choir and going to head to college with a full scholarship and kind of ready to take on the world. And, you, you know, it basically while I was in the hospital, I lost about 40 pounds. My body just emaciated itself. I lost all my strength, all my, we all my you know, 
capability that way. And then the medicine they had to give me to treat it basically caused me to gain weight. And so then I went from like losing 40 to gaining 60. And this is like in a round over like three months. And it's like, all right, let's start college. Welcome 12,000 people I've never met who don't know me. And I feel ridiculously insecure about myself. It had just changed so much in such a quick amount of time that I remember walking in there and I just was like, man, like, who am I? I just don't feel like I know who I am because I had placed all of who I was in this and that just got erased. And then now I'm starting this whole new chapter in life, which is supposed to grow and develop you and your great experiences. And I'm just feeling lost. And I didn't know where I was and what to do with myself. I didn't know how to, exp- you know, identify with people. They, hey, where are you from? You know, when you're like 40 like me, you can kind of talk about, yeah, I mean, I used to be good at sports, but now, you know, but this was like three months ago. You can't really, it's, you can't talk about the good old days when they were like 12 weeks ago, right? You know, um, I just didn't know what to do. And so I had this whole experience even through college of just figuring that out. And it turned into be one of the most transformational sports spiritually transformational experiences of my entire life, but it was born out of that experience. Um, but this question that I think that I, I found myself asking during that chunk of time, and I think it's one that I want us to consider this morning before we get started really is, hey, what, do you, what would you say defines you? What defines you? When you are introducing yourself to people or talking to people about who you are, what comes up? What do you base, like, this is who I am. When you say that phrase, what is that? Is it your job? Is it your family? Is it your, where you're from? Is it previous experiences? Is it, is it some great successes and victories that have happened in your life? Or there's some failures and damage and, and hardship in your background? What do you bring into the, to just every day that's like, this is who I am? And along with that, I mean, have you guys ever felt like you're being defined by others as something that you're not? Like, everybody thinks I'm this, but that's not who I am, right? You kind of fight for that. It's not me. Or the other, the other side of that is like, everybody thinks I'm this, but it's not me. Like, oh, if they only found out, if they find out, I'm just, I'm going to be messed up because they don't know the truth about me. Or maybe you're in a situation where, You've been given some sort of responsibility or have to step up to a challenge. You know, you're, you're newly married or you're a new parent or you got some new position at work, whatever else. You're like, ah, oh, I don't know how to do this. This isn't me. But you really have no choice, right? Because you just have to do it. You feel like an imposter, like this isn't me. I don't think I got what it takes to do this. I think that question of core of like, what defines you? Who am I? What am I? Is something that we don't, I mean, you're not sitting around journaling about that every day, right? But it just, it's always there. It's always something that we're mulling over and considering. And so what, what I've found with my life, and it seems to be true of other people, is that oftentimes when I'm asking that question, one of the last things I bring into that conversation is what does God say about who I am? I dig into a whole bunch, a lot of other questions about anything possible. But man, if I'm following Jesus, if I am, have placed my faith and trust in him, and I'm trying to pursue him with my life and let him change me, am I asking that question, well, who does, like, who does he say that I am? What does he say defines me? And so we're going to talk about that this morning And we're going to look in the book of Ephesians again, Um, just this section that we've been going through that Charlie talked through last week, one part of it. I'm going to narrow on a very specific part of it today that I think will help us answer that question. And I hope will just be a major encouragement and just help reframe the way that we live life and experience our our relationship with him and our experiences in life. And so um, I'm going to read scripture. I'm just going to read off the screen so it's the same one um, that you guys are seeing. But this is the passage from Ephesians 2. Charlie went through a good bit of this last week. Um, but I'm going to read through it and just for a little bit of context so we can see where we're going with this. Um, it says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, 
It's by grace you've been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And the phrase we're going to hone in on here and, and really pick apart in this passage is this idea that we are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. We are God's workmanship in Christ Jesus. This whole phrase, workmanship, you know, I don't know what you think about when you think of like, hey, you know, such and such is a work, you know, they're workmen, they are a handicraftsman, whatever else. That word workmanship is translated in other places um, or by other translations as masterpiece. The, the Greek word used there is really only used one other time in scripture, and it's basically the same forming and fashioning of the entire universe that God did. So the same word, and said, hey, guess what? You are the same thing. You are his handiwork. You are his masterpiece. You are his work of art. And it's God's work. It's not us. We don't make it happen. We don't come into being. We don't fashion it, form it. It's something he's working out in us, that he's shaping us, molding us, painting us, crafting us. And it's the work that he's done in Jesus, the gospel, the salvation, the things that we have in him that is working that self out in our lives. Even if you look through a, a, a longer list um, of going through the entire book of Ephesians, there's this whole before and after aspect, um, which is just um, monumental in seeing what the, trans, the transition that's happened in our lives. And so we've, we've gone from dead to life. We've gone from enemies of God uh, by nature objects of wrath that we have been cast aside that we are now, that's no longer true of us, but in Jesus, we are a part of the family, made alive, brought to faith, prepared for good works, things that have been transformed because of what Jesus did. It's this, this used to be this way, and now it's this way. It's, it's a monumental change in truth of who we are. But you know, when you think about a masterpiece and a work of art, something that's fashioned and formed and created and it's beautiful, right? Like you think about like, uh, you know, something like Leonardo da Vinci, right? Like it's in, it's the Mona Lisa, man. Or it's like, it's the statue of David. You're going in, you're like, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. But like if you're anything like me, like I don't, I don't really think of myself that way. Man, I am such a work of art, right? Get this angle, get this angle. I'm not walking around like, hey, look at me, I'm beautiful. I mean, maybe I'm like a kitschy piece of decor that you find like at a pilot truck stop, right? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take that. Hey, that's cool. But like masterpiece is not something that enters my head as something, yeah, I think that that's true of me. I mean, I'm a, I'm a codependent, emotional overeater with a savior complex. I'm not some beautiful handiwork of God. That's not how I feel. That's not how I think my life plays out. But no matter what happens to us or choices that we make, there are so many other things that I choose to let define me. What defines me? It might depend on like, what did I eat last night? What's my mood today? Is it cloudy outside? Because I don't like that. What's the weather like? How are my kids behaving? How did that thing at work go? How did that conversation with my significant other go? Did I land the deal? Did I fail that? Did I botch that? Did I live up to the expectation? Those are all things that I'm choosing to let come into that conversation to define who I am, what I am, and what I'm meant to be. But what's interesting is there's all these things that I'm, you know, even if we're kind of subconsciously asking, there's two questions that I think that, that out of this passage that we should put as the ruling filter through all these conversations. But they're the two questions that are always the least 
likely for, to pop into my head. They're the last thing I think about to ask. And the two questions to ask are, who does Jesus say that I am? And how is he transforming me? Who does Jesus say that I am? And how is he transforming me? If I'm God's workmanship, God's masterpiece in Christ Jesus, then what he says about me and who he says I am is vastly more important and should get a, it gets a lot more volume than whatever else comes my way throughout the days. And how he's using my life to form me, craft me, shape me is the most accurate filter to explain anything and everything about my life. You know, sometimes, uh, I guess just because of where we're at in life and in our culture and maybe our previous experience with church, the gospel and the transformation that, and, and the, the work that Jesus did, we just kind of, it's, we categorize it as that's something that happened in my life. You know, it was an altar call that I responded to or the passionate revival I was a part of or the, it was a moment in my room where I, I decided that I want to place my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the moment I became a Christ follower. And we, we stop the gospel at that. Well, that's just something that happened. Then the rest of the time, I'm just kind of going, you know, living in the Wild West and trying to figure out life. But the gospel, that doesn't speak to anything now. It's just something that happens. And we forget that the work of the gospel is something that is still happening to us now. Yes, it's a categorical fact that once you place your faith in Christ, that you are in him and you are saved from death and you were brought to life, that you were no longer an enemy, but you are now in the family and you have joy and hope and purpose. But now, today, there's innumerable truths in God's word that speak to who I am and what is still happening to us as a result of that. But that's not where we turn to look, right? And it's just, it's just default human behavior. Something negative or something hard or something comes our way. We're like, why is this happening? What's going on? Did I sin? Did I mess up? Did I, did I drop the ball? Is it my fault? Or on the flip side of like, man, we realize that we're all living in a world where I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, everybody else out there is a sinner, and we're going around just sinning against each other. You're hurting my feelings, I'm hurting you, I'm traumatizing you, you're traumatizing me. We're just going around back because that's just the world right now. Because we're just a bunch of, uh, like I said, a bunch of sinners sinning against each other, right? That's just the soup, the context. And so as a result, we're trying to tweak that, optimize that, and make it better, which I think is a natural human thing to do. We want to like, man, this isn't right. We want to make it better. But the place we start is not who does Jesus say that I am and how is he transforming me? We start with being like, okay, what can I do about it and how does this affect me? And we start looking for all the levers and the knobs and the buttons to push and things to tweak so that maybe we can optimize my personal experience on this planet. And that's what ends up defining me. And so instead of asking, looking into God's word first or holding that over as the main filter, we just, we just go directly to ourselves because it's just this, the, the, the default for us. You got to live your story. You got to live your truth. You do you. And then while we're trying to grow and, and get more mature, all these things are good. There's things we're bringing into that where we're trying to be more self aware. We're trying to be more emotionally intelligent. I want to get my DISC personality profile or my Myers Briggs personality profile. I want to dig into my Enneagram number and figure out why I'm wired the way I'm wired. Are you introverted? Are you extroverted? Are you an ambivert? What energizes you? What fuels you? What drains you? What, it, you know, what triggers you? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are your interests? What are your gifts? What are your habits? What are your hobbies? What do you cheer for? What do you celebrate? What do you rage against? What's your childhood? What was your family like? How is that informed now? Where are you at now? Are you married? Are you not married? Do you have kids? Are you not, do you not have kids? Are you divorced? Are you not divorced? The, my career, my addictions... There's all these things that we're trying to figure out and try to, to, to make sense of it all. But what's interesting is the number one common subject of all of those things is me. And that's where we start. It's me. 
And it doesn't negate the value of any of that. I'm not, I'm not trying to say so just don't do it or avoid it or whatever else. What I'm saying is that we get into this mode where we're, those are all the things that we choose to bring in to define us. And then who Jesus says that I am and how he's transforming my life is like a little salt we try to sprinkle over it to give it some more flavor. And it's the other way around. Like who Jesus says that I am and what he's transforming me to become, that is the bowl. That is the recipe. That is the outcome. And it's beautiful and it's a masterpiece and it's incredible. In my strengths and my weaknesses and my interests and my hobbies and my story and my victories, they're not negated. They're just another creative expression of how he's working that out in another human being's life. To think about ourselves as a masterpiece of God, something that he's working, that the gospel is moving in, that Jesus is still bringing things from death to life and bringing things from hopelessness to hope and restoration and redeemed, all these kind of words we throw around that's still happening in us. Um, what we have to realize when we think about just any masterpiece, man, y'all, mess masterpieces are they're messy, Right? Can you imagine, like, again, Leonardo da Vinci? I almost said DiCaprio in the first service. Um, maybe the same, I don't know. Leonardo da Vinci, like, he's going he's gonna to paint the Mona Lisa, right? And there's this blank canvas. And I don't know how the process went for him. He sketched a little bit on first. And he started, he's painting, he's shading, he's scraping, he's peeling things away. He's covering things up, erasing something over here to then replace it with this to add some more texture. That we're going to do this for shadow and for light. And we're going to scrape this and pull this down and splatter this on. Man, if you're the canvas, you're like, get off me, bro, <laughs> right? Duh! Because you're the... the the masterpiece is in process of being created. Or you think about the statue of David, right? This giant rock of marble. I don't, if, if, if that was to be personified, it doesn't really feel good to be chiseled and hammered and sanded and polished. Right? And they're just dirt and mess. But then it's like... Holy moly, now those two things exist and people pay thousands of dollars, travel across oceans to go and just see them in person because it's beautiful. I'm not an art guy. I mean, I love going up to Crystal Bridges and seeing things, but I don't like know all the stuff. And maybe you are, but a lot of us probably aren't. So maybe something that makes a little bit more sense to me is I think about, think about the absolute best barbecue you've ever had in your life. And you could smell it before it came out. That the, the spices and the rendered fat and the glorious juiciness of that meat, right? And you're salivating, anticipating, just Everybody's waiting for lunch, and now Brad made me hungry. And you think about that, and then think about the McRib sandwich from Walmart or from McDonald's. Evidently, there's people like I'm so fired up that the McRib, McRib is back. I don't know any of them, but evidently, it's a big deal. You can't microwave a masterpiece. Hey, we want to get some slow-cooked pulled pork. Would you put that in a microwave for like 30, 30 two or three minutes? It's not going to work. Because God's all about the process, the forming, the, sh the shaping, the texture, the flavor, whatever it is. The, the, the entire container, the recipe, the outcome is who he says that we are and what he is transforming us into being. And so everything else gets pulled through that filter to form it and shape it. And over time, seasons of life that you walk through, experiences that you have, joys, victories, pain, whatever it is, are ways that God is shaping that and letting you become more and more the masterpiece that he's making you into. We could probably spend an hour going around the room sharing the microphone and people could say, and I would ask the question, hey, 
what's one of the biggest things God's ever done in your life? And nine times out of ten, the story around that's going to be some sort of coming out of some sort of painful experience. Whether it's like we survived a major storm or like some relational thing that went on or something that happened to you and then you were redeemed out of. Because that's how God works in us. He doesn't take away the pain. He redeems it. The most evil, awful thing to ever happen in the entire humanity of history was Jesus Christ being murdered on a cross. And God made that into something that has rescued us. It doesn't negate anything that's bad. It doesn't negate or hate, or it, and I'm not even suggesting anything. Well, just if you've got problems, just ignore them. Like they're valid, but they don't define who you are. Or things that you love and hold on to that are like good, that like this is me and I love doing this. That's even that does not define you. Who he says you are and what he's transforming you to become are what define you. And it's beautiful. It is now and it will continue to become more and more so for the rest of your life. And then one day we're going to get into eternity and we're going to walk away and be like, holy moly. And God's going to be like, yes. Because it's good and it's a masterpiece. But it's strange because we're trying to figure out, do I have a role in this? This isn't like, okay, now just go do a bunch of more stuff to be more godly. You can't. It's God's handiwork in Christ Jesus. And so there's this mysterious process that once you become a follower of Christ, that you've been made and fashioned in his image, and all these new truths about your spiritual condition are coming to be that He's also working out in you and through unexpected, unrealized ways. But what I've become convinced of is that the way that we know that's happening and can be assured that that's happening is we continually revisit from his word who he says that we are. And I don't do that often. I'm assuming that's not, you know what? All right, I'm trying to figure more out about my life. Let me dig in about who Jesus says that I am. But if we can have that and hold that up, like I said, there is, we could have spent the entire sermon, I could have lined out every scripture of things that God has done or is doing through Jesus in our life, and we could have spent 30 minutes reading through those. Like there's, there's that many of them. It's not like this one little thing. You can Google that. Verses on my identity in Christ. You can come talk to Mark or I or Charlie, whoever else. Like, hey, what does the Bible say about who I am in Jesus? And that's a phenomenal way to spend some time. So that when you dig in and want to know how that wing of my Enneagram affects my behavior, you can have a filter that, man, God's made me that way because of who he's making me in Christ. Or my, my weakness, or this drains me, or this always seems to be something that saps my energy. I don't understand that. Then the filter through that is, what does God transform me to become? It doesn't say that stuff's worthless. It just puts it in context. As we are on a self-discovery, self-aware, all these things, Let's stop first and man, who does God say that I am? Let that define me. Let that say who I am. Let that bring us worth and hope and joy and rest. So as we're figuring things out and things change in our life and circumstances that maybe the identity crises we walk through will be shorter because <laughs> they're going to happen. But we can sit, okay, man, who's God saying? I want to know that and, and anchor in that first. So, I mean, the last, the only application step I can give you is to become who you already are. That's basically, if you wanted to boil our identity in Christ and the process of that is we are becoming who we already are. This is already true of us and we have unique individual expressions of that, but you are just progressively becoming 
who you already are and you get to realize it more and more over time because it's already true. We just get to have a phenomenal, exciting discovery of how many ways and in what specific ways that is true as a church and as people who follow Christ. Let's pray.